Hello everyone it is a very special day for me personally i'll tell you why on behalf of world federation neurology world brain day team and social media team it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce you to a great uh, human being who had contributed a hell of a lot uh, to world federation neurology as i here in fact it is because of him that i am here today talking about brain health to you you would it would all come to uh, the realization very soon this is uh, emeritus professor nimal sena naik he is uh, from the same medical school which uh, baked me today uh, the, he was a student uh, then a professor of medicine senior professor of medicine and later on dean his story is a is a very moving inspiring story to many youngsters uh, all over the world professor sena naik very good day to you very warm welcome to you the uh, world Fed world, good, day. World. good day guys very nice to see you again and uh, my greetings uh, from kandy from sri lanka to you and the world federation uh, my senior and junior colleagues you you would probably be surprised to hear that uh, i actually came to know about the existence of uh, world federation neurology uh, as a senior medical student uh, or senior years uh, having read uh, a little poem that you wrote to ceylon medical journal i believe uh, you attended uh, the world congress neurology at london and then you did some reflection it was a couple of lines uh, i can't remember exactly off the top of my head but that was how i came to know world federation neurology but this is not about me today is about you so professor ranayak tell us about your uh, early days uh, in the medical school take us uh, back to uh, those those days yeah 1965 to 1970 i must say that in the medical school uh, i was just an average student pre and uh, para clinical subjects never appealed to me all my interests were in the ward with patients i must uh, let me take you back in time to mid uh, 1970 when my destiny changed final exam medicine long case a thinly built middle aged lady a neurology patient and asked to make matters worse the kind of patient that gives cold shivers to to a candidate but i wasn't put off i knew uh, i had done my clerkships well my teachers had uh, coached me well i looked at the tongue a bag of worms motor neuron disease bulbar palsy unfortunately that was the diagnosis unfortunately for the patient anyway when the results came two distinctions and gold medals that gave me the opportunity to do my internship in kalambu and the professor kumar das rajasurya an excellent teacher and a brilliant clinician let me recount uh, an incident uh, that happened uh, a few weeks later the incident that i never forget when i walked into the female ward a patient was making wild gestures with the hands and uh, saying something unintelligible attempt to attempting to draw my attention my patient now in kalambu she was so happy that i was her doctor we both felt emotional you sometimes relieve often comfort always well i comforted her as best as i could during her stay this is the human aspect of clinical medicine clinical neurology um uh, then the next name that i i must mention is that of uh, professor k n senaviratna then professor of physiology and an internationally reputed uh, neurophysiologist 
many papers in the green rack on the effect of ischemia on the diabetic nerve. During my spare time, I did a clinical study for him on the same theme. I was rewarded uh, with an original publication in the Journal of Neurology and Neurosurgery Psychiatry in the green rack. Then, during my internship and subsequent register period, uh, two more worthwhile papers, uh, Arsenic Polyneuropathy in the Ceylon Medical Journal and uh, Permanent uh, Neurological Deficits Complicating Sinoidal Block, British Heart Journal. Well, not bad for a junior doctor. I'll stop you there, the Professor Yananayaka, for a moment. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, a great opportunity to remind our weavers uh, how very important uh, for someone who is building career to uh, have the luck of uh, getting good mentors. Uh, the, the, you need uh, a good mentor to guide you through the process. Uh, I remember very well from my own days, uh, uh, I had a more or less uh, similar uh, the journey to your life uh, and I wasn't particularly keen of scoring high during the first couple of exams but during the final year as I thoroughly enjoyed patients uh, accidentally I ended up uh, in the very sort of top uh, ranks uh, of the final year results. Uh, you were the dean of the faculty of medicine at that time. Uh, I was interested in writing and I was inquisitive and curious uh, but I had no idea where I should head. Uh, you asked from me uh, Vijayaratna, what are your plans? Uh, I said to you sheepishly that I think uh, I like candy. Uh, I think uh, I like peradenia. I think I like medical education uh, because I was working as a temporary demonstrator in medical education unit. Uh, then I said to him that I also like clinical medicine. Maybe I'll join the medical education unit and uh, do, a, uh, do a sort of a internal medicine plus uh, the, the neuro, the, the and the medical education. Then you looked at me from top to bottom and you were busy, of course, you had not much time, but you said to me that, I think if you like medicine, Vijay Ratna, it is better that you concentrate on medicine first. You are probably likely to be able to get your internship sorted at the Colombo Professorial Unit, the very place where you did the internship. And then you said that, perhaps uh, you should uh, contemplate uh, on a career in neurology and uh, you basically the crafted my whole future for the next 10-15 uh, years, uh, including overseas training at that time. Uh, I think uh, uh, the I repeatedly say this at multiple meetings that uh, while you have a journey ahead of you, it is good to have mentors. Sometimes they spend a lot of time with you. Sometimes it's just a passing remark like that, uh, that basically decide your destiny. And of course, the papers that you mentioned were, were actually game changers. Later on, uh, when I met up uh, some of the donors in Australia, they told me that uh, although they were unraveling some uh, new mysteries in motor neuron disease uh, in neurophysiology, they were still going back to some of those original neuro neurophysiology papers by Professor Seneviratna, and they were quoting that uh, you are from Sri Lanka. They said, do you know that uh, you had some great people who did uh, some pioneering work in neurophysiology. Uh, the, I spent this, I sort of steal this time away from you to just remind our viewers the importance of uh, mentorship, uh, the, the crafting your journey. Professor Yenanayak, uh, tell us uh, what happened next uh, after the internship. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, I must say that uh, that about uh, two or three years in Colombo, that made a big difference. Not that I did not like Peradini, but certainly I, it, uh, my heart was there, but still I went to Colombo and do this internship there because of one thing, the great professor of medicine, Professor Kumar Das Rajuri, and then of course, it was more or less by chance that I came across uh, uh, Professor K. N. Shenugra, who was a great human being. I mean, apart from being a good uh, teacher and a scientist, but I mean, it's a very, it's a, as a very human person. So we were more or less friends at the, towards the end of my uh, three year period. Anyway, 1973, I came back to Peradeniya, this time as lecturer in medicine. Then uh, in a year's time, I got the opportunity to 
go to England uh, uh, for overseas training. My application for a registrar post at Queen's Square was uh, successful, mainly because of my publications in the in, in international, international journals. I worked first as medical registrar to the neurosurgical unit under Professor Valentine Log and Professor Lindsay Simon, then in medical neurology with Drs. Ralph Rossassel, William Goody, and Peter Raj. Uh, the next stop was the Wessex Neuro Center in Southampton with Professor Michael Sedgwick, who was the professor of uh, clinical neurophysiology, probably the first professor of clinical neurology in uh, England, I, I, you know, I think. And then Dr. Lee Ellis, who also who was also a Queen's Square trainee, they gave me the confidence to function as a consultant in neurology at, uh, by the end of my three-year probation study leave period. Then it was uh, somewhere in September 1977, I came back to Sri Lanka. Well, then I uh, started the first neurology clinic and the neurophysiology service in Kandy. Within a few months of my return, I witnessed a strange, a strange epidemic. Adolescent girls from uh, TSTH came down with an acute polyneuropathy. Gianbara syndrome, but uh, there were features that didn't fit, although many thought this was Gianbara syndrome. Well, I traced uh, it to ginger oil because I, there is a very interesting story, but I don't think the time permits. Uh, having collected uh, uh, all the data, when I went through those carefully, I noticed that uh, the onset of the neuropathy was related to the onset of Menake. And uh, during Menake, according to the customs of those uh, girls, uh, they were given uh, ginger oil to drink. And you know, they had uh, for about seven days, sometimes for about two weeks, they had taken. And then I suspected that this must be something in the ginger oil. And that suspicion was confirmed. Uh, the ginger oil contained tricresyl phosphate, which was a known neurotoxic agent that had caused uh, epidemics of uh, polyneuropathy. All, in, all over the world uh, from time to time. Then, again, about the same time. Uh, Professor Aaron, I'll, spend, I'll, I'll, I'll stop over in this story uh, the few more minutes. Uh, you would be delighted to hear that this is a story that I share with uh, my residents uh, year after year. I tell them that uh, why physicians should be like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I tell them that uh, when you came back from UK, the, when you didn't have the luxury of a whole lot of wards or support system and other things, uh, you had to start from the scratch, basically. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but you are not going to settling down with uh, uh, diagnosis uh, that uh, would fit into the symptoms. Uh, you were basically the Sri Lankan version of Sherlock Holmes uh, in medicine. Uh, and uh, this I heard uh, many times uh, th throughout my stay in Sri Lanka and uh, even when I'm overseas. Uh, when these girls uh, came to you with uh, wrist drop and foot drop, uh, you could have easily settled with uh, lead poisoning or variant of GBS, uh, uh, not worried about writing things up, not worrying about uh, going and uh, expanding the horizon to see what the hell was happening behind them. Just to remind our viewers, uh, in Sri Lanka, I have three sisters. Uh, usually when uh, the girls attend Menaki, the custom, at least those days, was uh, they were isolated from rest of the others uh, in the family. And then uh, there are sort of different cultural traditions, uh, the food and drinks uh, 
that they are provided with is very different. So what Professor Enanayak is telling us is uh, when he was taking the history on those patients, he realized that each and individual person who came to him with wrist drop and foot drop were given gingerly oil. And he was exploring what was actually happening. And then he managed to sample this uh, gingerly oil. And then I believe you sent them to CDC to analyze. Uh, and then they found you found that they were contaminated with uh, triothocresyl phosphate. Uh, and you basically fixed that uh, uh, in uh, epidemic uh, once and for all. And there had been no cases of gingerly oil policy ever since. If you haven't done that, uh, for years, uh, we would have had uh, girls uh, suffering from wrist drop and foot drop and probably more or less permanent uh, peripheral neuropathy. I think this is a story that we should uh, continue to tell our young colleagues, uh, especially junior colleagues who are from a different generation, that why it is very important, uh, despite, the, despite the sexy MRs and rest of the other technology that we have, at the end of the day, what you inquire from your patients and having a meticulously curious mind is going to reward you. You, you, you mentioned this uh, when I had the luxury of interviewing you as a first year medical student. Uh, uh, I think I walked up to your room and I did a column called chat uh, to one of the popular science weekly. I asked from you the, the, how the hard it is to do this uh, research uh, as a busy specialist uh, and uh, they convert them to research papers. You again look me from top to bottom and then you said, Vijay Ratna, it is very easy. You just need to keep your eyes and ears open and don't settle with uh, the unanswered questions and keep uh, looking for answers. Uh, I spent a few times to elaborate on this uh, for the benefit of youngsters that are out there, whether they are in Americas, Africas, uh, or the sub-Saharan Africa or most remote part of Asia and certainly colleagues in Australia and Sri Lanka also. And it would continue to be the, the same thing. I got a few other things to the clarify from you also. Am I correct to say that uh, you managed to get the first EEG machine uh, that was donated by great late Professor Harry Mianadi and you did the first comprehensive uh, full channel EEGs first time in Sri Lanka. Am I correct saying that? Uh, that's correct, yeah. Uh, but anyway, let me just uh, add a few more lines to this, uh, the organ, organ of phosphate uh, business, because about the same time, again, I uh, started seeing similar patients after organ of phosphorus uh, insecticide poisoning. You know, they had taken that as, uh, as a suicidal attempt. And then, again, Exactly the same picture, very crippling, very, very focal uh, motor polyneuropathy affecting the hands and the feet. Now, uh, again, when I presented this uh, in Candy, I mean, very of, many of my colleagues were very critical. In fact, they more or less ridiculed me. What are you talking? Because organophosphates uh, cause uh, a polynergic crisis. It, it doesn't affect the peripheral nerves. But of course, uh, well, I didn't uh, want, want to argue with them. But anyway, I just uh, went ahead with and collected these patients and finally proved that they, they were due to some, some neurotoxic uh, uh, organophosphorus pesticides like metamidophos. And then I must say that uh, uh, the Organophosphorus induced delayed for neuropathy and uh, the afterwards what I described as uh, intermediate syndrome that is causing uh, weakness of uh, cranial innervated muscles uh, about three or four days after poisoning. And these, uh, I was able to get this into the New England Journal of Medicine. Again, the, the, I'll elaborate on this a little bit more, just to remind our viewers the, 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 the impact of what uh, Professor Sena Naik and his colleagues uh, done from Pera Denia at that time. Uh, I grew up in rural Sri Lanka. Usually, at least at that particular time, uh, the, it is very easy for you to get hold of a big uh, bottle of uh, organophosphorus insecticide uh, including the, the other the insecticides such as paracot and other things easily. To tell the, the story, 
Uh, at one point of time, Sri Lanka, the Pearl of Indian Ocean, basically became the, the world record holder committing suicide, uh, partly for the reason that uh, it was so easy to access uh, these uh, poisons. Uh, to tell you a personal story, in my hometown, I lost uh, six of my classmates uh, who were, they were not uh, suffering from pathological depression. Maybe they had an argument with their parents or argument with their teacher or someone in the village. Uh, they would just walk up to the local boutique, uh, pay like uh, uh, two cents or three cents uh, from uh, US dollars or, or half a cent from Euro to buy a lethal dose of uh, these uh, poisons. Uh, and uh, the, the, it was uh, Professor Sena and I, can, we should also remind his uh, uh, close colleague, uh, Professor Lachman Karaliyadde, who were doing this uh, original pioneering game-changing work. Again, I question on you this when, as a first-year medical student, as a young journalist at that time, I asked from you, how did you discover this uh, intermediate syndrome? Then your answer was, uh, the, you realized that uh, some of the patients with uh, organo, the, the, this pesticide poisoning that were under your care, uh, they were suddenly dying. Your residents and registrars were telling them when you were inquiring that they passed away. So you were very inquisitive to see that what was happening, that they seems to be recovering from acute cholinergic crisis. Uh, but what was killing them? Because uh, pulmonary embolism was not, at least as far as we knew, was not that common in Sri Lanka at that time. So the, that's how you the, put your Sherlock Holmes mind to it and investigated this and then told the world that uh, there is a neuromuscular junction problem that is causing respiratory failure. And then th that went on to further work. Uh, you produce uh, the peradeni organophosphorus in insecticide poisoning scale, very much like glass coma scale. And uh, you are going to tell us uh, how this, uh, the, 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 the move into generation of uh, truckload of uh, new generation toxicologists, uh, uh, the, including Professor Indika and multitude of others, uh, and uh, the Australian uh, researchers benefited a uh, hell of a lot uh, also. I took this time to elaborate uh, the story to remind our viewers uh, how real translational research uh, happened. Uh, and then I think uh, this pioneering work led to probably save uh, uh, millions of lives in Sri Lanka. And those sort of pesticides uh, you can't get hold of easily uh, in Sri Lanka at that time. This probably could have lo the, lost uh, my life also. My own brother uh, took uh, the, the one bottle of this uh, insect, the, the, not in insecticide, but some sort of poison. And I remember as a sort of a 16 or 70 year old boy, although it was a fight between us uh, caused the issue, I was firmly decided that if I lose him, I was going to take my life away also. I did not want to live without him, at least at that time. And uh, the, fortunately, he survived, and he ended up doing medicine and becoming an academic also. And uh, the, the I survived, and I ended up uh, becoming a useful academic to the world also. So, uh, Prof. Senanayaka, your work, uh, uh, the bit after bit, uh, I'm just telling the world uh, how they have become game changers and how they have saved uh, enormous uh, amount of uh, lives uh, uh, the, with uh, uh, unmatched uh, the, 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 the work uh, to Sri Lanka by any standard. This is not a criticism against uh, any other academic out there, but I'm yet to see such impactful research uh, from anyone's hand. And you did all these things uh, with no internet, no Skype, no Zoom, and uh, the, the, with uh, no NHMRC or, or Wellcome Trust grants. Uh, and you are basically doing this with the uh, minimum salary that you are getting uh, and uh, the truckload of clinical workload uh, while your own colleagues were probably ridiculing you and not supporting you uh, at, at the same time. Again, I'm not mentioning this to criticize anybody. Uh, the idea is to bring the humanness uh, and courage and desire and passion to the area so that youngsters that are out there, if you are facing challenges, take them as a blessing. Uh, you just uh, extract the best out of your brain and uh, you can contribute uh, enormous amount of the humanity. And Professor Sena and I go back to where you were talking about these things. Yeah, as, as you just mentioned, I mean, I don't, uh, I never applied for a research grant for this. In fact, I had, I had, I don't think I have got more than one uh, research grant uh, in my entire career. See, it was all uh, based on largely history and the physical examination. 
careful history, uh, thorough physical examination, and relevant investigation. So that is what I picked up from one of my clinical teachers uh, uh, during my second year appointment. So I think from that day, I think still it has stuck in my mind. So I think if you have the will, I think you can do these things. So let me now come to epilepsy. Uh, your uh, question about uh, the, you mentioned uh, Professor Harry Menard is name. Well, I think while well, I, re, um, that was my good fortune that I met him and then he was a great person, a great uh, uh, individual and uh, uh, one of the leading uh, epileptologists, Professor Harry Menard from the Netherlands. And I think uh, uh, my contact with him more or less uh, had a big impact on my academic life. Um, he, in fact, visited Candy and then he saw the condition, conditions under which I was working there. And then he was uh, very keen to provide me with facilities to develop epilepsy in Sri Lanka because by that time, during those days, the epilepsy word epilepsy was in singular, of course, you know, there are two or three other terms used like apasmar, uh, uh, and so, uh, then the many people had no idea what this was. And uh, they were still going in for uh, local remedies and even things like uh, various, I believe, you know, uh, offering to gods and that kind of thing because they saw it, they thought like in the ancient days that epilepsy was uh, caused by some divine influence. So anyway. That was that, very true, Professor Seranayaka. I remember when my sisters uh, were having uh, simple febrile fits. Uh, the, my parents were reasonably educated, but they didn't even uh, the, like to use the word. They call uh, in Sinhala Narakalide, that means uh, the bad illness. Uh, in, in other words, uh, even reasonably educated believe that this was some sort of a demonic uh, influence uh, or some sort of a devil's uh, influence. Uh, and such was the ignorance, uh, even among reasonably educated communities. Uh, we were provided with a whole lot of books and magazines to read as young kids uh, by our parents at that time, despite being in rural Sri Lanka. So they were wanted us to learn and educate. Uh, but yet, uh, that's the sort of attitude that they had, uh, uh, the, the, even in uh, sort of late uh, 1980s. Uh, uh, go on, Professor Senanayak. Yeah, this, there was a big stigma attached to epilepsy. I think once the diagnosis is made, I mean, the people are very upset and uh, uh, some people even didn't turn up for the next clinic date because, I mean, they thought they, they will be better off, uh, you know, hiding this and uh, doing something uh, uh, locally. So anyway, so Professor Menadi, uh, first you asked about the EEG, EEG apparatus. He got me the, he, as a grant, he got me a, an EEG apparatus and then he planned to do a commun community health project on epilepsy. The basic the idea was to send people to the periphery, to the village, and then collect data on epilepsy, particularly first the prevalence, because he, he believed that he should, first we must define the uh, extent of the problem to take uh, remedial action. So that's what he did. He, he got people to go to villages and then uh, collect uh, data on this and then they referred uh, the patients to me, my clinic, and I coordinated the whole program. And uh, with that, I think we completed the study within a few months and that gave us for the first time in Sri Lanka some idea about the prevalence of epilepsy in the country. Well, that was about uh, 9 per thousand at that time. 
Uh, Professor Iranayak, I remember this 9 for 1000 very well. I, uh, uh, this is another story that I share with my residents. Uh, I tell them that uh, this is how one should do uh, epidemiological studies in the community. Again, you were super clever and uh, the, the way that you approached, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, wrong. I'm going back uh, my memory lane almost 20 years now. You basically approached uh, one of the volunteer groups called Sarvo there in Sri Lanka at that time. You told the Sarvo there leader that uh, you need two people from each village uh, who are reasonably educated. Uh, and then you brought uh, hundreds of them to the medical school. And then you trained them how to take a basic epilepsy history. You did the first uh, the screening to gather potential epilepsy cases. Uh, and then you subject, if I remember correctly, well over a thousand of them to do EEGs. Uh, you classify each one of them according to International League Against Epilepsy or whatever the parallel organization that you, they had at that time, and you meticulously recorded them. I attended uh, your epilepsy clinic uh, as a young junior lecturer for almost three years before I migrated. Uh, you were the dean at that time. I think uh, the, I learned whole heaps of uh, basic history taking and assessment at that time. I remember vividly that you would return some of the files with my notes saying that uh, Vijay Ratna, this is not good enough. Uh, bring this patient back, retake the history. And that was a steep learning curve for me personally also. And uh, from memory, you had uh, probably close to 2000 uh, well-characterized uh, epilepsy patients, uh, clinically classified, uh, EEG wise classified, uh, medication-wise classified, uh, seizure control-wise wise classified, refractory epilepsy-wise classified. Uh, I still believe that there are a couple of good solid PhDs uh, in this field. I don't believe that uh, there is any such resource uh, anywhere in the world uh, in resource-limited countries. So that's another example that I wanted uh, viewers of uh, this story to take home, that uh, it is not about you, it is about uh, medicine and humanity and what you do might have ramifications for generations to come. So this, uh, the, what you described just now uh, is uh, one of the best neuroepidemiological studies that I have come across, uh, having read widely globally. It is up there uh, the, among the top uh, neuroepidemiological research anywhere in the world. I believe you won a gold medal and a uh, number of uh, the, the orations uh, for this work uh, later on. Uh, and uh, it would stay within Sri Lankan history as uh, pioneering, game-changing moments in one of the disorders that is affecting brain health uh, significantly. And we should also reflect uh, on the greatness of uh, Professor, late Professor Harry Mianadi also, uh, Professor Seranayak, we both know that uh, he was an orphan. His mother died uh, in Indonesia the, as part of the war. He himself was in prisoner's camp. Uh, but the great thing to extract out of him is uh, what happened to us during childhood uh, doesn't make us uh, bad people. We should convert that to a positive experience and continue to give to the community as uh, best as possible. Uh, those of you who wanted to know about Professor Harry Mianadi, they can go to International League Against Epilepsy website and uh, the look around them. And Professor Iranayaka, what you have done to epilepsy in Sri Lanka uh, is again another unmatched uh, contribution to uh, the development in Sri Lanka and certainly the brain health uh, globally. And I'm not surprised why WFN leaders continue to talk about you uh, at, the, at every meeting, uh, even now, because your, your contributions uh, is uh, unmatched uh, by miles. Uh, the other topic that we wanted to move now on uh, your creative work, uh, you, you won an award uh, of uh, the patient awareness. Uh, so it was in your heart uh, that uh, bringing patients and their families to the foray, you wanted to uh, address this stigma and you use the medium of art uh, to, to, to talk that, uh, the, 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 the get that message across. So tell us about that story, uh, the, how you made that movie and how you end up winning this uh, gold medal for this. That's an interesting story. Um, in 1983, when I attended the uh, Epilepsy International Congress in Washington, D.C., there they announced that uh, they were going to have a, an audio-visual festival uh, in two years' time at the next meeting. And uh, they would like to 
uh, invite for entries in various categories. So I thought, well, I think I must uh, submit something. Because this is something different to what I have been doing so far. And then uh, I remember when I was during Atlantic crossing uh, in the plane, I just uh, thought of a theme for the presentation. In fact, then I thought of uh, doing a drama rather than just a straight documentary because I mean, there are documentaries, of course, uh, many documentaries on epilepsy. But I thought I will do something a little different and do a drama. So, and that, that's how I, that's the time I thought of the story. Once I came back, uh, I contacted uh, one uh, of uh, the leading uh, film directors in Sri Lanka, Mr. Dharam Singh Patraj. And uh, when I discussed, well, well, he was, uh, he said, okay, yes, uh, uh, Professor, I will do it for you, but I could see that he was not all that enthusiastic because after all, I was uh, uh, only a doctor, you know, uh, not a uh, recognized uh, script writer or, or, or anybody in that field. So anyway, he asked me to okay, write the script and give me, I will see. Once I gave the script, I think his, uh, the whole thing changed. I think he was, uh, uh, he didn't have to change anything in the script and uh, uh, just let a few edit, edit a few things here and there. And then he was very willing to uh, do the film. So anyway, within, in fact, a very short period, we did that uh, two hour film, uh, I think, because the, now it was close to the uh, next epilepsy Congress in Hamburg, 1985, the, the course to that only we did the film. And then I remember, I got the copy in the umatic form uh, at the airport. He just brought the final because up to that point he was editing, and I took that to uh, uh, to the presentation meeting. And then of course uh, the rest, you know, it uh, in the drama category it won the uh, gold award. Is that documentary somewhere saved, Professor Nanak, that people can access? So the has it uh, gone? Uh, uh, the missing now? Well, I mean, this is something actually, uh, because now it is so many years and then uh, Dharm, Mr. Dharmasena Patira is no more. And when I asked, in fact, I asked this question uh, so many years ago, so many times, and then uh, he tried to locate the originals, but still we haven't been able to do that. Maybe there's a, because we showed that on the national television network through Pohaini. Probably they might have a copy, but I have been trying to get one. So I, anyway, yeah. I'll keep trying. It, it is definitely worthwhile trying uh, the, I remember during my student days at Pera uh, the I was organizing uh, film festivals and we organized uh, one of the Indian film festivals. Uh, uh, the, unfortunately, there were only three people attended the film festival, me and the two other co-organizers. Uh, so we watched it at the, 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 the art gallery in Peradini University, just three of us. Uh, so we had spare times and then we read uh, how the Satyajit Ray made uh, this Apu triplet. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing is uh, the way that he made this film and it won a lot of awards uh, and how he delivered the films was exactly similar to what you just said. He, the, someone has to deliver his uh, movie at the airport and uh, somebody was running to the airport security check-in uh, so that uh, that could be delivered at this uh, film festival where he was nominated and awarded. Uh, it just came to my head as you as you are telling the story. So yeah. the, the, the please uh, try your best to locate it and it's, it must be secured and stored uh, for the benefit uh, of uh, greater good uh, of the whole world, basically. Uh, and the other, other thing is uh, your, your creativity was uh, very visible uh, the, during our student times and uh, you, the, you end up uh, producing uh, the, the number of uh, national hits uh, uh, the on various stories. Uh, would you like to tell us a few things uh, about that creative side uh, also, or 
you were, we have yeah. few other things to talk about epilepsy also before we get there i think i i feel obliged to tell some of these things um, one thing of course uh, during this period i uh, developed my interest in reflex epilepsy and as you know i described uh, several types of reflex epilepsy which had been not well recognized up to that time one was eating epilepsy we had a large number of cases and then uh, uh, epileptic seizures uh, uh, triggered by cognitive function so anyway uh, why i mentioned this is uh, because uh, professor menadi in fact later on got me to put this in the format of a book and submit and then he was instrumental in getting a phd from the netherlands uh, uh, on the, on this on this team on the reflex epilepsy that is one and the next thing was that he uh, he was instrumental in making me an ambassador for epilepsy and i was the first uh, sri lankan to receive that award the other one i should uh, uh, mention at this point is that uh, during this during my journey i met several very important and uh, remarkable people and uh, i i cannot forget the names uh, one is dr noshir wadia and uh, uh, from uh, bombay india the other one is professor k s mani from bangalore uh, there are so many others uh, uh, i think the list is too long but i will not but I, these two names i'll particularly mention because i met them very early uh, when i attended these meetings and uh, from the very first meeting i think we became lifelong friends i mean they were very senior well established well respected uh, uh, neurologist epileptologist i was just a junior guy you know uh, two i was uh, associate professor but uh, but at that time but still i was new to the field but i mean we i mean that is their nature i mean so wonderful people and they they were they just took uh, on equal terms and then uh, helped me wherever i need, need needed and then uh, we maintained that uh, uh, relationship that was a uh, lifelong friendship and i am very sad uh, that now uh, they are no more with us but anyway i must uh, uh, recall them with uh, with uh, great respect and and, and, and and fond fond memories also i i totally agree in fact the indian neurology colleagues uh, during the pandemic last year they helped us immensely to spread the world brain day message and rest of the other things uh, they started the, se the webinar series called uh, neuro infections uh, which became quite popular they now run a series called inspiring people in neurology in fact i have nominated you to be taken up as a topic uh, in time to come so you would receive the invitation i think in first week of july of, of this meeting i'll send you the link uh, they are going to talk about professor wadia as uh, the one of the inspiring person they talked about uh, the the similar fisher sometimes back uh, raymond adams uh, sometimes back uh, uh, i think c david marsden and there are a few others uh, along the way some living and some uh, no longer living with us so these are these are great uh, men and some women also who contributed immensely uh, so thank you for reminding me to uh, the, the the reminding me of those uh, those uh, great uh, people uh, i think uh, the we should put on record that uh, your contributions uh, in epilepsy i am not surprised that a uh, person like great uh, late uh, professor harry mianardi wanted you to be the first ambassador you truly are an ambassador for brain health uh, for had had been for a long period of time certainly you put uh, epilepsy in the map uh, in sri lanka uh, the, the 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 which is basically unmatched by anybody even today as far as i can see from published records uh, and uh, certainly in par with uh, any other world class epilepsy service uh, uh, the even though your resources were much uh, limited i fondly remember when i asked from you how to differentiate a spike wave from a spike and wave 
you told me that uh, this uh, spike uh, you can sit and uh, your bottom would hurt, uh, but wave you sit and you it it won't hurt you. And I still use that sometimes when I teach uh, the, the 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 we talk about EEGs to my trainees and medical students uh, here. So yeah. tell us about uh, uh, your visiting scientist uh, experience uh, with uh, Professor Gustavo Roman in uh, 1990 and 91 period uh, and. Uh, how did that come out? Come about, and what did you get out the, of it? That? That's the name I should mention next. As you said, I in 1990, 1991, I got the opportunity to uh, uh, go to the NIH Neuroepidemiology branch in Bethesda uh, as a visiting scientist, and there, the newly appointed uh, chief of the Neuroepidemiology branch was Gustavo, and he said. Again, a very fine person and uh, uh, very knowledgeable. And uh, even by that time, he had made a remarkable, a good name in the field uh, of tropical neurology. So again, I think I was, it was my good fortune uh, to have met him and you know worked with him during that one year period. And we did uh, a lot of work together. And then I think and we uh, produced uh, many publications and uh, journal articles and then chapters to books and uh, uh, that was Professor Gustavo Roman and uh, I record my sincere thanks at this point. He, he still talk about you fondly at uh, every WFN meeting that I had been to uh, the, I have been involved with WFN since uh, 2005 regularly and I'm reasonably heavily involved as you can see now. Every time when I'm in the speaker's lounge or at meetings, uh, he would tap me and ask uh, uh, how is uh, the, the Professor Sena Naik, uh, how is he going and we miss him uh, and uh, is he well and this and that. So I give them whatever the update that I gather from Chinese whisper about uh, the you from Sri Lanka to him from time to time. I believe he's uh, standing up for vice president uh, position at WFN this year, which would be heavily uh, competitive, of course, uh, as two, three people are uh, the applying, uh, the applied as far as uh, I can see. They're all great people. I think any one of them can be our vice, vice president and push uh, World Brain agenda, which, which has really taken a great momentum now as, as, as far as I can see. Then uh, the... Uh, Wish you all the best. Thank Indeed. you. Professor Naika, unfortunately for many of us, uh, then uh, the you were forced to take up an administrative position. I think uh, during my time as a junior lecturer in Pera Denia, had you been the, the, the chair of medicine and department head, uh, my personal journey probably would have been different. Uh, not that I'm complaining, uh, but uh, the 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 you, you, you became the dean of uh, the second uh, medical school uh, that uh, the, the Sri Lanka has established. Uh, sec sec second or third, uh, you can correct me. And uh, the, the, tell us about your dean experience uh, of this uh, magnificent, uh, uh, beautiful medical faculty where you have contributed to generating well over 6,000 undergraduates. Yes, actually, I was not very keen about uh, this administrative position so, and all the climb the ladder so to say in that in that uh, field but anyway but my colleagues who had the medical faculty many of them they said i think high time you became the dean and uh, put the faculty in the right direction and that's why i i took this as a challenge and i then uh, i did in fact two terms and because at the end of the the first term i thought i can get back to the department but then again again still there was pressure from my colleagues so I just continued but anyway um, it was a good experience and I hope that I was able to do something for the faculty anyway but uh, as you say uh, well I continue with, continue with my clinical duties but still uh, I uh, didn't have much time to devote to research during that period. Uh, that said uh, you still uh, the the you still uh, supervised uh, the general neurology and I believe uh, first dedicated headache clinic in Sri Lanka because you were wanting us to 
use uh, International Headache Society classification system at that time, myself and one of the senior registrars, uh, again, you had well over 1,500 headache patients in that registry. You were very keen for us to maintain meticulous records. Uh, we were young and naive and our minds were like butterflies. Uh, don't know how cleverly we have collected those records, but I remember vividly that I heard about International Headache Society for the first time uh, the, at that time when we were classifying headaches. I don't believe there was any other neurologist uh, in the country who were doing records as such. Again, this is not a criticism. This is to put on the record who did what for the first time and how it is beneficial for us to build services. Uh, second, uh, the, your epilepsy clinic, you still managed to supervise that regularly. You came and read all the EEGs. And Wednesday morning, we had uh, our most uh, feared and revered ward rounds uh, with you. I remember, again, I'll reflect uh, on a few things. Uh, this is where the, the, the you did uh, ask or organize uh, us to send CSF samples to London to check uh, CSF oligoclonal bands. Uh, we did not know about anti aquaforin antibodies, so anti-MOGs at that time, that science was not uh, existing, but you got us to the think on, on them. Uh, I personally remember you got me to use uh, uh, the triptans uh, for the first time uh, we were, I learned for the first time uh, the usefulness of uh, clinical goals on treating headache patients. Uh, why you want to treat patients to get rid of their symptoms within one to two hours and avoiding the, the, the medication overuse headache, although we didn't know that term at that time. I think uh, the, despite uh, your research output suffered, uh, despite uh, you couldn't uh, probably mentor us uh, more closely at that time, you were uh, the astute uh, clinical observation skills were paramount uh, at that time. You may recall that many outside uh, residents uh, and registrars uh, were keen to be in neurology ward at that time on Wednesday mornings uh, for that ward rounds uh, as they knew that there were a lot of clinical pearls and gems that would be thrown at them at that time. Uh, we, the, the, let's, let's get back to your creative side of things. Uh, I'm going to surprise you with uh, the, the, the unprepared question now. Uh, you can uh, the, correct me if I got this wrong. I was told by one of your close colleagues, uh, I wouldn't name him, that during your young student days, uh, you used to read uh, uh, heroic stories uh, and printed them under a pen name, and they were quite a hit in Sri Lanka. Is this truth or myth? No, oh, that's correct. In fact, I asked her. As a schoolboy, I think I was David about 14 years, and then uh, I wrote uh, a lot of these uh, detective stories, you know, paperbacks. Th those were very popular those days. And then, uh, in fact, I think that by the time, you know, during the next, uh, after coming to the university, I stopped that, doing that. Right. But uh, during that about two or three years, I, in fact, uh, pub uh, print published uh, uh, some 20, about some 25 books. No, thing is, I mean, I don't think those, uh, looking back, I don't think those stories are really, I mean, uh, I would say, would not say great, but still, what was great was that uh, a schoolboy uh, from the village uh, contacting publishers in Colombo and getting them interested in my work and then my books and then getting them to print this. And that was the, I think, looking back, I, that's the one I am happy about, you know, because uh, it was not easy to publish a book those days. Even now, I suppose it's a uh, little different, but uh, very difficult. But still, those days, there were a limited number of publishers. And then uh, it was uh, not all that easy to get them. So, but anyway, I did that and uh, I, I'm happy about that. So the, what I what I was meant what I meant the, what I was wanting to draw your attention viewers attention is uh, your creative nature was obvious uh, when you were 13 14 years of age uh, to have uh, 25 books under your belt uh, before you come into the medical school even but you took them to a completely different level uh, uh, as a senior clinician later on so uh, share our view, uh, share with us uh, your creative aspect uh, from then onwards. Yeah, okay. So uh, now, as you said, you see, after that, after my, after entering the university, this, uh, that kind of artistic creativity probably was suppressed. 
I think I had to because the heavy demand uh, for time in the medical school and then subsequently I more or less forgot that and then it was uh, rekindled uh, again I think uh, thanks to neurology and epilepsy because you see I told you how I did this uh, drama television drama on epilepsy so I think that is the time I suddenly got back on that track because I contacted this uh, my film director friend and then once he finished that when we when he concluded that uh, film teledrama television drama uh, successfully and then i just wanted to do a few more and then uh, he was also interested and then i kept writing scripts for television dramas and then i think uh, uh, anyway i up to now i would have produced about uh, written and produced about uh, about 15 or 16 uh, television dramas you know which are shown on uh, uh, several uh, tv channels in sri lanka and uh, many of them were award winning and uh, in fact i also got uh, one or two awards as the best script writer for the year and they were, they were brilliant stories i remember uh, some of them were being telecasted uh, during your tenure as a dean. I remember even uh, after board meetings, some of the senior lecturers and senior professors were slightly trying to get to your ear and see what happened then at the next episode. But I don't think you ever told them what's going to be at the next episode. Uh, the, uh, you, you, your contribution to uh, the mentees uh, and juniors uh, are uh, immense. Uh, knowingly or unknowingly, you probably contributed to production of a large number of uh, neurologists uh, also. To name a few, uh, I am uh, one of the example and I already told you that if not for that corridor conversation, uh, my career would have been taken a different path uh, completely. Then uh, the, uh, there is a great uh, neurologist at uh, Barrow Institute uh, USA, uh, Professor Sivakuma. Uh, he was uh, one of your student uh, uh, and uh, then uh, the Dr. Padma Gunaratna, the current uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association president, uh, she was a graduate from Peradeniya. Uh, then uh, Dr. Sudat Gunasekara, the senior neurophysiologist, uh, and then uh, the uh, Professor Vajiravira Singh, who trained in neurophysiology. He followed your footpath, uh, Professor Taraka. I mean, I mean uh, the, 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 I could go on uh, listing the names. Uh, uh, I, I believe uh, you have trained uh, probably well over 6,000 undergraduates. Uh, uh, the, the share us, uh, share your experience uh, about uh, being a teacher and uh, seeing your students uh, at various places. Uh, now, how would you feel about uh, uh, where things are looking back uh, or the, the decades uh, over your career? Oh, certainly, yes. I think looking back, that's the thing that gives me the greatest satisfaction i mean to see my students in uh, different places here in sri lanka and abroad different countries holding very important positions you know very high positions uh, not only in medicine even in the fields of uh, uh, politics you know even in sri lanka there are several ministers now who were uh, my students so i mean so that this is the kind of thing that gives me satisfaction. I suppose that's the thing that should give satisfaction to any teacher, because uh, you can you can see that uh, your attempts had not been wasted. I think uh, this is uh, is really uh, a very fine, very nice experience. And this uh, gave you a nice segue to uh, the, the, the come to the final uh, section, session of this interview. Uh, what is your take home message to future leaders, uh, upcoming youngsters? Uh, I want you to frame your message thinking of uh, young medical students, uh, male or female, wherever they are, uh, young general medicine registrars, uh, neurology registrars, uh, uh, interested in basic science, uh, clinician science, uh, whatever the challenges that they face, what's your take home message to them? I think uh, we mentioned a lot throughout the story, but just summarize it to them. Well, one thing, of course, the 
uh, as a teacher, although I had done research and published papers, I in my teaching, I always emphasize on the basics. I think that is one thing. I think that we, we cannot uh, uh, get away from that, that, you know, simply because you have the, the latest uh, equipment for your investigations, still you should not forget your basics because if you for, forget your basics, then you go the wrong way because uh, no amount of investigation can correct that if you get your history wrong and if you get your physical examination wrong. Because a good example now, the intermediate syndrome, how did I detect that? Not by using fantastic machines or not by EMG, just by doing a thorough clinical examination, thorough physical examination, thorough neurological examination. Because uh, you see, in a patient with poisoning in the intensive care unit, very few took the trouble to examine the nervous system, except that the level of consciousness was uh, reduced and the plantar subgoing maybe, but that's it. But here I did the thorough physical examination and that's how I detected this intermediate syndrome. Now it's really in the medical textbook. And you know, I'm so happy about that. Uh, about when I look back, that's the thing I am very happy. So finally, of course, uh, research now, uh, well, I don't know what, whether what I have done is research or just to me, it is just an extension of uh, clinical medicine. Uh, something a clinician cannot avoid. Uh, so you call it whatever you like, research or whatever. Then, yeah, I uh, recollect the golden lines of uh, Nubi Pasture. He said, chance favors the prepared mind and opportunity favors the bold. So I think this is something uh, which I really, uh, I think that fits in very well with what I have uh, achieved so far. He also says, to be astonished at anything is the first movement of the mind towards discovery. So this is what is important, to be astonished, you know, because don't be put off simply because you're the, the history and the physical science that you elicit do not fit the great diagnosis given in the in a medical textbook. I mean, you don't try to uh, cut and chop your physical science to fit the diagnosis uh, to a textbook picture. But rather than that, that's what I have done. Rather than that, look for, look and see how this particular patient differs from the others. I think that is where you pick up these clues. And that's the, to be astonished at anything. Like say in the intermediate syndrome, I mean, the patient died, paper patients who are recovering, die on the third or the fourth day. Why? I think that is the, uh, that was the, uh, approach that to look for a reason and uh, because if you do that if you look for the unusual features then you will pick up the gems that are scattered uh, on your path on your professional journey you were spot on uh, professor like uh, once again in fact uh, i myself have witnessed the tr very truth of what you just said Last year, we were bombarded with uh, the largest number of uh, COVID-19 cases. Uh, in fact, we managed uh, well over 1,500 patients. Uh, my junior team felt that I was going mad. Uh, I was basically plotting variety of uh, cells uh, on spreadsheets, uh, asking them to calculate this and that. Uh, we pointed out to the world for the first time that uh, long COVID is indeed uh, post-COVID-19 neurological syndrome. We defined that. Uh, and then we showed uh, how simply calculating neutrophils platelet and dividing it by lymphocyte uh, and looking at that ratio serially, how it is predicting who is going to uh, develop what. Uh, that was also published uh, as a very fast publication. And uh, I saw that last time when I checked, they were cited by like uh, 40, 50 people already. So the, the very simple things, uh, just by having an astute mind uh, and brain, helps you to understand uh, 
So they were all your basic teachings uh, at that time that we continue to carry over even other parts of the world now. Coming back to World Brain Day, I remember about 10 years ago, we were talking with the uh, then president and a couple of other colleagues uh, over a cup of coffee that uh, while we do know that neurological disorders are the leading cause of disability, how come we don't have a particular day to celebrate uh, brain function? After all, uh, all what you talked about, uh, your contribution, your creativity, you are now a well-known singer in Sri Lanka. You compose uh, lyrics uh, and you sing and uh, the, you basically address uh, very the deep human emotions uh, through those uh, songs, uh, love, romance, uh, and things like that. Uh, they all part and parcel of our brain function. So when we plan World Brain Day at that time, never in my dream, I thought that this would uh, go to 100 million, 200 million mark. I was now getting emails from journals like Nature and Lancet uh, asking us to comment uh, on World Brain Day and this and that. Uh, and I think uh, before we die, Professor Anayak, we should be able to see probably close to half the population in the world uh, do aware that uh, it is our brains and brain function which makes us uh, as humans. And uh, the, it is important for us to protect that uh, and promote uh, that health. Uh, and globally, just like we are trying to battle this COVID-19 pandemic with universal approach to vaccinate, uh, eventually there would be a day that we sort out brain disorders from global approach. Uh, we are not there yet, but uh, I am determined as best as I can during my time uh, with the WFN colleagues and rest of the other organizations, uh, hopefully we would uh, fix this mess uh, once and for all. Uh, you may be delighted to hear that World Federation Neurology now uh, the work with all other neurology organizations uh, as an umbrella term, Global Neurology Alliance. Uh, so basically, the content that we create to propagate World Brain Day brain health messages uh, would go to every neurology groups uh, from International Headache Society, Epilepsy, the International League Against Epilepsy, Movement Disorder Society, World Psychiatry Association, World Association of Neurosurgeons. Uh, it's, it's happening slowly. Uh, the, the, so I am, I am, I am eternally optimistic. Uh, just like uh, you wrote uh, that beautiful drama, Suba. Hopefully, we could resurrect that and uh, let others uh, watch it uh, one more time, if not more. Uh, your story is uh, indeed uh, truly inspiring. As I said uh, multiple times, uh, you are the game changer in practice of neurology in Sri Lanka. You have contributed uh, immensely to the global literature. You saved uh, millions of lives in Sri Lanka by addressing some of those key issues. Uh, we forgot to mention that uh, your work uh, in clinical toxicology uh, led to a couple of uh, massive NHMRC grants. Uh, I had the good fortune of uh, assessing one of those grants uh, as an assessor. Uh, I had to declare conflict of interest, uh, but as I have not collaborated with any one of you for like a good five years, I had no conflict of interest. Uh, but assess that with uh, reasonable high marks. Uh, and that created a whole new craft of uh, new generation toxicologists to the world. Uh, you produce a Sri Lankan being the president of uh, Southeast uh, Asian uh, the Toxicology Society. I think you can be incredibly proud of uh, what you have done, not only to the Sri Lanka, but to the humanity and to the world. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, the, the, the time that we spend together today would be a nice permanent record uh, for World Federation Neurology Archives to remember and realize uh, what you have done and then take a leap out of your book uh, uh, and uh, the contribute to the humanity during our time on this planet as best as we can. It is uh, always a pleasure to talk to you, Professor Ranayaka. I am incredibly grateful to you for making me who I am today during my formative years and giving us your precious time to share your story and letting me ask uh, intimate questions uh, to the, the, the open up your heart and then get your story out there so that uh, that story can inspire generations to come. Thank you so much and we wish you all the very best and stay well and uh, the good luck with all your endeavors, uh, including your, uh, the, the expanding creative career. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, this, uh... Thank you for inviting me to be on this uh, 
in the, on this uh, program. And then once again, my greetings to all my colleagues in the WFM. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Take care.